In this video, I'm going to discuss complex numbers. You might have heard of complex numbers before, in which case this video might be a useful refresher of the important concepts of complex numbers. And if you haven't heard of complex numbers before, then great, you can look forward to learning something new over the next 10 to 15 minutes. Complex numbers are really important in spectral analysis and time frequency analysis, signal processing more generally, because Fourier coefficients are nothing more than complex numbers, as you will learn soon. So let me start by showing you the real number line. This is the number line that you are used to seeing basically your whole life. So we have zero in the middle, the negative numbers to the left, and the positive numbers to the right. So all the numbers that you are typically used to working with, certainly in like practical day-to-day -day life, is on this line. So the idea of complex numbers is to extend our system of numbers from a one-dimensional line to a two-dimensional plane. So now we have something that looks a bit like a Cartesian axis, where one axis is called the real axis, it's all the real numbers, and then up here we have the imaginary axis, and this contains imaginary numbers going up and down. Now the unit of the real axis is the number one, so you can think of cutting up the real axis into units that correspond to the number one. Likewise, the unit on the imaginary axis is the number i, or the operator i. This is called the imaginary operator, and is defined as the square root of minus one. Now, this is a weird looking thing because square roots of negative numbers don't actually exist. And for that reason, they are given this special letter i. Sometimes people use j. Typically in mathematics literatures, you would see i, and in engineering literatures, you would see the letter j. So what does this mean, and where does this come from? Well, mathematicians have known for a really long time that there needs to be some way to solve a problem like this. We need a solution to an equation like this. And it turns out that the equation or the solution to this equation does not exist on the real number line. So therefore, mathematicians came up with this kind of exception, this, this special case of an imaginary operator. Now, for a very long time in mathematics, this imaginary operator was just treated as kind of a bizarre, exceptional case. It wasn't formalized into a system of numbers. In fact, it was Gauss from the Gaussian distribution who had the really creative and intelligent insight that we can build an entire two-dimensional number system by thinking about the imaginary operator as a basis for an orthogonal axis, so for a separate axis to extend this real number line into a complex number plane. So that is the basic idea of complex numbers, that we take a number that has two parts, a real part and an imaginary part, and the imaginary part has this little funny looking i attached to it, which is the square root of minus one. Now, complex numbers are a little bit weird. They're weird to think about. It's kind of a funny concept, but don't lose sleep over what complex numbers mean, what the imaginary operator means, how exactly to interpret this quantity, you know, whether intelligent life elsewhere in the universe also developed the system of complex numbers. You don't need to worry about any of that. All you need to be concerned with is that complex numbers and the imaginary operator are very useful for applications in signal processing, engineering, applied math, physics, and so on. So don't worry about the meaning of complex numbers. You can just be concerned with their use, their applicability. So why are complex numbers so useful? Well, complex numbers are so useful because they contain a lot of information. In fact, they contain a lot more information than is just present in real numbers. So for example, with real numbers, all we have is kind of two pieces of information. We have the magnitude, which is like the distance away from the origin, and then we have the sign, which is negative or positive or zero. But complex numbers contain a lot more information. So complex numbers have these two parts, the real part and the imaginary part, and you can see that when drawing this complex number on the graph, on the complex plane, it ends up being a point in the location corresponding to uh, these coordinates. So 
two units over on the real axis, three units up on the imaginary axis. So already, without even thinking about it too much, we see that complex numbers contain two pieces of information, the real part and the imaginary part, and each of those also has its own sign in addition to its magnitude. And we get even more information than just what's present from these two numbers on their own. We can also extract the magnitude or the length of the complex number, its distance away from the origin. And that is not a function of only the real part or only the imaginary part. It's actually a function of both the real and the imaginary part. So this is called the magnitude or the absolute value of the complex number, the distance away from the origin. And then we also have the angle here, which is the angle of this line. So you imagine drawing a line from the origin of the complex plane to the complex number. And the angle of that line relative to the positive real axis is the angle or the phase of this complex number. It's also sometimes called the argument of the complex number, although most people just use the term phase and I will also use the term phase or angle. So essentially we see that there is a lot of information that can be packed into this complex number. And that turns out to be important for the Fourier transform. You will learn later, so I'm just giving you a little bit of, a, of an insight now. A Fourier coefficient is actually just a complex number, and the magnitude of that Fourier coefficient is the amplitude, which we can square to get power, and the angle relative to the positive real axis is going to be the phase of the Fourier coefficient. So more on that in later videos. What I want to do now is talk a little bit about working with complex numbers, in particular multiplying two complex numbers. So imagine we have these two complex numbers z and w, and each one has a real part and an imaginary part, and note that the imaginary part of a complex number is just a regular number, it's a real valued number, but it's multiplying this i character, so the imaginary operator. So how do we multiply z and w? Well, it would be, you know, it might be easy if we just multiplied a times c and then b times d. But it's slightly more involved than that, although it's still not too bad. Essentially, to multiply two complex numbers, you multiply both the real and imaginary parts as if these were expressions that you had to multiply out in algebra. So to perform this multiplication, we have to distribute all of these individual multiplications. So z times w is a times c, and then we have a times di over here, and then bi times c here, and then the final term is bi times di. And now notice that in this final term here, we have i squared. And because i is the square root of minus 1, i times i, or i squared, is actually just minus one. So this simplifies a little bit to minus b times d. So we still do end up with a complex number that has a real part containing, in this case, a times c and minus b times d, and an imaginary part, which is the cross term. So a times d i plus c times b i. And now I'd like to introduce you to another important concept in complex numbers, and that is something called the complex conjugate. So the complex conjugate is a complex number where you just flip the sign of the imaginary part. So imagine this is our complex number a plus bi, then the complex conjugate is a minus bi. Notice we haven't changed the magnitude, so a is the same, b is the same. All we've done is flip the sign of the imaginary part. Also notice that we're not changing the real part. So this doesn't become minus a, this just becomes minus b. And this is not just about making the imaginary part negative. We actually just flip the sign. We multiply the sign by minus one. So if we start off with a complex number that's a minus b, then its complex conjugate is a plus b. So this is the algebraic interpretation of a complex conjugate. There's also a geometric interpretation, which is essentially that if you have a complex number here, the conjugate of that complex number is its mirror image flipped across the real axis. So you can see we don't do anything with the real component that stays the same. 
and the magnitude of the imaginary component is the same, so the distance away from the center is the same, but it's just flipped on the y-axis, so we just flip it across the real axis here. So what is the point of a complex conjugate? Well, I'm going to show you one application of the complex conjugate in combination with multiplication of complex numbers. So here's a question. If this is the complex number 3, 4, i, so that's represented here, and uh, the, the grid spacing is not equal on these two axes, so you have to forgive me for that. But anyway, uh, so this complex number is 3, 4, i. The question is, what is the length of this line here? What is the magnitude of this complex number? How, how far away is that complex number from the origin? Now, you might already guess that the number, the answer, is 5. And how do we know that this answer is 5? Well, we know this from applying the Pythagorean theorem. So remember, the Pythagorean theorem says that if we have a right triangle, then a squared plus b squared equals c squared. In other words, the length of the hypotenuse, which is what we can consider this line to be, is the square root of 3 squared plus 4 squared, and that's 9 plus 16, which is 25, and the square root of that is 5. And of course, there's also these special Pythagorean triples that you might have had to memorize in school. So 3, 4, 5 was one of those triples. Okay, so, so we just sort of know that because we guessed it. But how can we uh, figure this out? How can we compute this using multiplication and the complex conjugate? Let's just see what happens when we multiply z by itself. So we multiply this complex number by itself, and we get, so 3, 4i times 3, 4i. And then you can work out all the multiplications. You end up with minus 7 plus 24i. Now, that is definitely not the length of this line. First of all, we already know that the length has to be 5. But even more importantly, this doesn't even make sense. A length cannot be negative, and it doesn't make sense for the length of a line to be an imaginary number. All right, now let's try this again using one uh, by taking a complex conjugate of one of these z's. So now I'm going to multiply z by its complex conjugate, which is sometimes indicated using a, a bar on top like this. So let's see what happens with this multiplication. Notice that we have the minus sign here. So we have these terms, so 3 times 3 is 9, and then we have 12i here from 3 times minus 4, uh, well, I, let me see. So this term here is actually this inner term here. So 4i times 3 is 12i, and then we have 3 times minus 4i is minus 12i. So that's pretty interesting. These two imaginary terms will cancel each other out. And then we have an imaginary term here, but it's squared. So this becomes a minus i, and that actually also cancels out this minus term. So we end up with a result of 25, and of course the square root of 25 is 5. So it turns out that if you multiply a complex number by its conjugate, so z times z conjugate, you are going to get not exactly the length of the line, but the squared length of the line, so the squared distance away from the origin. And again, just to give you a little bit of foreshadowing to why I'm showing you this in this video, when this is a complex number, then the complex number times its conjugate gives you the power at that frequency. So you will learn in a few videos that the result of the Fourier transform is a series of Fourier coefficients, one Fourier coefficient per frequency, and when you multiply each complex valued Fourier coefficient by its complex conjugate, then you're going to get the power at that frequency. So that's just something to, you know, pin in the back of your brain, and we'll get back to it later on. What I want to do in the next video is introduce you to Euler's formula, which is also an important way of working with complex numbers.